Molly was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. Old Molly was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole friend, and sole mourner at the funeral. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, a man of business even the very day of the funeral. There is no doubt that Molly was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. Scrooge! A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Merry Christmas, sir. Humbug. Once upon a time, of all the good days of the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather. The city clocks had only gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been light at all day as a dense fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep an eye upon his clerk, Mr. Cratchit. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Bah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come now. What right do you have to be dismal? What reason do you have to be morose? You're rich enough. Bah, humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this Merry Christmas? Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. Uncle, nephew, it's Christmas in your own way, and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then. Much good it has ever done you. Uncle, there are many things of which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited. I dare say Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I've always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time that I know of in the long calendar of the year where men and women seem by one consent to open up their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures found on other journeys. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in me pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good, and I say God bless it. Let me hear another sound from you, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder if you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with me in Beth tomorrow. Yes? Yes, Elizabeth, my fiancé. I'm dining with the people, and I'm sure they welcome a visit from you. You're engaged? Yes. May I ask why? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. You intend to marry as soon as I'm earning enough money. I see. Has she tried her relatives? <laughs> that wasn't the reason for my visit. Good afternoon. Uncle, I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. There's no reason why we should be enemies. Good afternoon. Uncle, I made this visit in homage to Christmas, and I intend to keep my Christmas spirit to the last. And so, Uncle, Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. I said good afternoon! Merry Christmas to you too, Bob. Merry Christmas to you and your wife to me. Thank you.
Scrooge's nephew, on his way out, had led two of the people in. The gentlemen, pleasant to behold, now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands. Scrooge had never painted out old Marley's name from a warehouse door. There it stood, years afterwards, Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes, people new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Marley. Yeah. Or Mr. Scrooge. My name is Scrooge. My name as well. And mine is Rummage. And Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley's been dead seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. On Christmas Eve. As good a time as any. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. Liberality? At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are on one of common necessaries, hundreds of thousands are on one of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are very busy, sir. I wish I could say they were not. <laughs> I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. However, they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of any mind or body to the multitude. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time since a time of want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall we put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make my area, I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. My taxes support the workhouses and prisons. They cost enough. And those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it. Decrease the surplus population. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business, and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. In that case, we must apologize for interrupting you, sir. Humbug. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentlemen withdrew. As they exited, the owner of one scant young nose appeared on Scrooge's stoop to regale him with a Christmas carol. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Yeah! Scrooge resumed his labors with an improved opinion of himself and in a more facetious temper than was usual with him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened, the ancient tower of the church became invisible, and its gruff old bell struck the hours and quarters with tremulous vibrations as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense, piercing, searching, biting cold. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. It's time to stop work. Thank you, sir. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient and it's not fair. If I were to dock your wages for the day, you'd think yourself ill-used. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It is but once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. Oh, I will, sir. Oh, I promise I will. Thank you, sir. 
The office was closed in a twinkling, and Cratchit, with the long ends of his white scarf dangling below his waist, ran down the lane, only to be hit by an arsenal of snowballs. Cratchit threw his perfect snowball and expertly hit the top hat clear off of Scrooge himself. And to make matters worse, a carriage drove by at that precise moment and ran it over. Oh, yeah! Oh, oh, I had no idea it was you, Master. Truly, Master. Master, 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 Master. No doubt this is your idea of a Christmas joke. Oh, I'll get your hat, sir. Cratchit, I told you before that I could find a man more capable than yourself. I need say no more. You mean I'm sucked, sir? Exactly. But in my paper, sir, it says I must have a week's notice. Your week's salary will recompense me for the price of a new hat. I say, Governor, we are sorry. The old stinker. Cratchit left the boys with the dread of having to go home and tell his family that he had lost his situation on Christmas Eve. But as he was walking, he heard the singing of carolers, and his spirit was lifted. Here we come a caroling among the leaves so free. Here we come, all the leaves so fair to be seen. Let all the joy come to you, and to you what tidings do. And we wish you and send you a happy new year. Cratchit ran home, stopping along the way to purchase all the necessities for a joyous occasion. A goose, potatoes, apples, oranges, chestnuts, everything to make a feast fit for a king. He wouldn't let these events ruin Christmas. Meanwhile, the cold became intense, piercing, searching, biting cold. But what did Scrooge care? He took his usual melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers, went home to his melancholy bed. Scrooge lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who notes every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old entry of the house. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all peculiar about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then, let any man explain to me, of how he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any immediate process of change, not a knocker, but... It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look. The hair was curiously stirred, and though, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled would be untrue, but Scrooge was not a man to easily be frightened. Still, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Satisfied that all was as it should be, he retired to his chamber. He closed the heavy door and locked himself in, double locked himself in, which was not his custom. As he changed into his night clothes, he heard the violent ringing of bells. They were succeeded by a clanking noise, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain 
coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. Without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because any little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them alter. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. Ooh! Dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly minds, do you believe in me or not? I do. I must. But you are bound. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. But perhaps you would to know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself. Jacob, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limit of our money changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob. Slow? Seven years dead and traveling all the time. The whole time, no rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast? On the wings of the wind. You might have gone over a great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh! Oh, captive bound and double iron, not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunities misused. Yet, such was I, oh, such was I! But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Oh! At this time of the rolling year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, never giving to my fellow man? Hear me, my time is nearly gone. If you must go, Jacob, don't let me keep you. How is it that I appear before you in a shape that you can see? I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, Ebenezer. What is it? You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. I think I'd rather not. Unless you suffer these three visitations, your fate will be the same as mine. Expect the first when the bell tolls one, the second on the stroke of two, the third on the last vibration of three o'clock. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over? Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. Jacob, do not leave me yet, Jacob! Remember, the first at one, the second at two, the third at three. Humbug. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or, the glim or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, Scrooge went straight to bed and fell asleep. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavoring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes when the chimes of a neighboring church began to strike.
Is it a dream or not? Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old person. Its hair, which had hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and in the tenderest bloom was on the skin. It wore a tunic of blue, trimmed in the fur of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and, in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light. Are you a spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No. Your past. The light. It hurts my eyes. It blinds me. I'm not surprised. It is the warming light of thankfulness, the light of gratitude to others. I've never seen it before. Of course not. It's men of greed, like you, who have long forgotten gratitude. What's your business with me? Your welfare. Your reformation. Rise and walk with me. But I'm not a spirit. I am mortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be safe. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road, with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold, wintry day, with snow upon the ground. My old school. I was a boy here. Old Scrooge was conscious of a thousand odors floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. Do you remember the way? Remember it? I could walk it blindfolded. Strange. I've forgotten it for so many years. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate in post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Students were seen setting her off to head home for the holidays. They were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music that, that the crisp air laughed to hear it. Christmas, Jack. Your parents coming for you? No, I'm staying at school for the holidays. You are? Always do, you know. Father and I talked it over. We decided that some extra swatting at my studies would do me more good than Christmas at home. Christmas, plum pudding, and turkeys? That's just for children. I say, your governor must be a crusty old bird. He knows what's best. 
I didn't mean anything against your father, Ab. Good luck. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane, and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick with a little weathercock surmounted cupola on the roof, and a bell hanging in it. They went in and proceeded to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made bare still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these, a young boy was reading near a feeble fire, left alone with nothing but his book. School is not quite deserted. But why do you replay me this memory? There was a young and lone boy singing a Christmas carol at your door last night. I wonder how he may have felt to be so quickly shunned and easily forgotten. Let us see another Christmas. Abby! Dear Abby, I've come to bring you home! H home? Fran, home? Yes! Home for good! Home forever and ever! Father's so much kinder than he used to be that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should. And he sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're never to come back here. But first, we're to be together all the Christmas long. And we're going to have turkey and chestnuts and have the merriest time in all the world. God bless you, Fran. Abby, it's going to be so glorious. God bless you. She loved you. She did. I believe she had children before she died. One child. Your nephew, Fred. Yes. Let's continue. I was apprenticed here. Why, it's old Fezziwig! Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again! Yo ho there, Ebenezer Dick! Oh, yo ho, my boys, no more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick! Christmas, Ebenezer! Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. <laughs> what a lark! He always comes through, doesn't he? Always comes through to his old Fezziwig. And royally, too! And royally, too! Nothing's too good for Fezziwig. Closed up tight? Tight as a barrel, sir! Good! Now, about tomorrow. It's a holiday, of course, but I shall expect you to spend at least a part of it uh, with me, eating Christmas dinner. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, sir. sir! And as you'll be too, uh, you'll eat too much to be any good the next day, we'll make that holiday, too. <laughs> good night, sir, and thank you, sir. Yes, sir, thank you, sir. Solid gold is old Fezziwig. Solid gold through and through. What is the matter? Nothing in particular. Something? I think. Old Fezziwig was very kind to me. Yes, he was. But he's dead now. Perhaps you feel you'd like to repay his kindness to you. Well? You have a clerk, Bob Cratchit. Old Fezziwig would have been very happy if you had shown your gratitude to him by showing kindness to others. Your clerk, for instance. Business is business. I'm a good businessman. My time grows short. I have yet to show you the black years of your life, your gradual enslavement to greed, your ruthlessness, no. your ingratitude, your wretched thirst for gold. No, leave me. I can't stand more. I can't stand more. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. With that, the spirit's bright light began to dim until Scrooge was alone, surrounded by darkness. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. He had barely time to reel back into bed before he sank into a heavy sleep.
waking in the middle of an immensely tough snore, and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was upon the stroke of two. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time, for the especial purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. Scrooge got up and shuffled towards his door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. Come in! Come in and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so, it was clothed in one simple red robe, bordered with white fur. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were bare, and on its head it wore no other covering than a holy wreath, set here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its opened hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanour, and its joyful air. You have never seen the like of me before. Never. Have you never walked forth with the younger brothers of my family, meaning my elder brothers, born in these later years? I don't think I have. Nay, I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, Spirit? A huge number, some 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for. What are we going to do? Walk into the world this Christmas night so that you can hear and see and feel Christmas in the world this night. Conduct me where you will. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. His bed, his chamber, his very residence vanished all instantly. They stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. The sky was gloomy. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town. And yet... There was an air of cheerfulness, for the people were jovial and full of glee. What are these people doing? The poor find it cheaper to bring their dinners to the baker to be cooked. Now then, what are you stepping on? What you I'm stepping on? I like that. Go on, off it. I will not. Why, you little... Here, let's make it up. Frotting day. I wouldn't touch your old hand. I wouldn't. Well... You're not such a bad sport after all. Thank you. And a Merry Christmas to you. What do you sprinkle to make them stop quarreling? It's a spirit five times distilled. The spirit of Christmas cheer, of love, of all that's good, of all that makes this time of year different than any other time. Hey, you big clumsy ox, what you stepping on? Ah, oh, I'll shove those words right down your nasty little throat. Hey, stop shoving! Stop shoving, I say! Oh. Here we are being still, are we now? Oh, like a couple of infants. I say, I know a nice pub where they saw hot rum and gin. We stopped that. Yes, we did, didn't we? And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men, that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe, and on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with a sprinkling of his torch. What has ever got to your father then? 
then? And your brother, Tiny Tim? And Martha wasn't as late last Christmas day by half an hour. Merry Christmas! Here's Martha, Mother. Here's Ma Martha, Mother. There's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are. We had a deal of sewing to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, Mother. Well, never mind so long as you are come. Sit down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. God bless you, Mary, gentlemen. No, no, there's Father coming. Hi, Martha, hi. Oh, yes, yes, hi, Martha. Hello, my family. Happy Christmas, Mama. Happy Christmas, Tim. Hello, dear. Oh, I'm sorry we're late. Why is that off? She's not coming. Not coming? Not coming on Christmas Day? I'm afraid not. Oh, Father, I'm here. Merry Christmas, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Oh, my dear. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Tim. Merry Christmas, Martha. Was it a good service for? Beautiful. That's what it was. I wish you were there. So long as you and Tim were there, I feel it is all good. And how did little Tim behave? As good as gold and better. Somehow he gets stopped for sitting by himself so much and makes the strangest things you ever had. He told me coming home that he hoped that people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and upon seeing him, the people might take greater pleasure in their blessings and health. And then he made me promise not to tell his brother and sisters because they never hear the end of it. I do believe our tiny Tim is growing strong and hearty. Good, good. I'm going to take one last look at the table. What a Christmas! There never was such a Christmas. Then working hard, Father? How's it Scrooge? Same as ever. What's the matter? Not a thing. Not a single blessed thing. Something at the office? Shh, your wife has been sacked. Father, when was it? Last night. You haven't told Mother? Bad luck. Sorry I told you. I really shouldn't have. I thought it might make me feel better. Bob! There's Mother. Sure. Come along, here we are. It's a good day. Martha's him, we're all him. Oh, my little family. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. God bless us. God bless us. Now let's see this glorious news. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a clutch of Alan Warner, carefully preserved. If these shadows are being haunted by the future, the child will die. No, no kind spirit. See, he will be spared. With the kind of care that money can buy, who can tell? But Bob Cratchit has no money, not even a position. If these shadows are being haunted by the future, the next Christmas will not find Tiny Tim here. But what of it? If he'd be like to die, he'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh, what's delicious goose? Yes, yes, it's delicious. Quite right, right, you little marvellous. You're so scrumptious. And now, the pudding. <laughs> oh, I'll love you, Mother. No, I'll do it. It might not turn out. Of course it will. It always has. Unless, of course, someone has stolen it. Stolen it? <laughs> <laughs> it's there. The pudding's there. Hooray! I smell it. Do you smell it, Peter? Oh, that's the cloth coming off. The holly's in its blazing. Here it comes, here it comes, off with the light. It did turn out, and it's not stolen. It looks like the best you've ever made, my dear. Bob, you say that every year. Every year they get better. And now for the punch. A toast. A Merry Christmas, my dears, and God bless us all. And here's to next Christmas. May it bring us all luck. And may Mr. Scrooge give your father a raise. And a Merry Christmas to Mr. Scrooge. I'll we'll drink to that.
By this time, it was getting dark and snowing heavily, and as Scrooge and the spirits went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlors, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. And it was a great surprise to hear Scrooge to hear a hearty laugh which he recognized as his own nephew's laugh. Fred, he said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, he did. Your uncle should be ashamed. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. After all, he punishes himself. And how does he do that, pray? Well, he has money, hasn't he? Yes. And he makes no use of it, mark you, no use of it whatsoever. Therefore, he's a far, far more pathetic and unhappy case than a man who has no money at all. Now that's a wonderful idea. Tom here suggests that we play a game. Now what shall it be? Lyman's Bluff! Bluff. Lyman's Bluff. Right. But first I want you to drink a toast to my uncle. It seems a shame to waste a toast on a man like that. But darling, think how happy he makes everyone else feel. By contrast. To my uncle Scrooge. To, to uncle Scrooge. Scrooge. Yeah. But you don't like Christmas. It's a time for fools. I won't go with you. I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay, I tell you. Don't be a fool, man. You don't like Christmas. But I do. I do like Christmas. I love Christmas. Angels, we have had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged to the unconscious company in return. But the whole scene passed off in the breath. He awoke feeling a great chill, like a window had been blown open. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting his eyes, beheld a solemn spirit, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spirit I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. I shall follow gladly. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, 
for the city rather seemed to spring up about them. But there they were, in the heart of it, amongst the merchants who hurried up and down, and chinked the money in their pockets, and conversed in groups as Scrooge had seen them often. Two of these men stopped for their usual morning exchange. Scrooge knew the men, and approached to listen to their talk. No, I don't know much about it. Either way, I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. Well, what has he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me. That's all I know. Well, it's likely to be a very cheap funeral, for upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Perhaps we should form a party and go to it. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, but I must be fed. As the men strolled away, Scrooge looked towards the spirits for an explanation. They glided on into another street where two others were meeting. Scrooge listened again, thinking that the explanation might lie here. Good day. How are you? I know them. I know them both. Business associates. So, Scratch got his own at last. Yeah, so I've been told. It's cold, isn't it? Seasonable for Christmas. You're not a skater, I suppose. No time for it. Business on my mind. Well, good morning. Good morning. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversations apparently so trivial. But, feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They left the busy scene and entered a dwelling in an obscure part of the town where Scrooge had never frequented before. He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round in it, obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon a bed, and now he almost touched the bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay the body of a man. He lay in the dark, empty house with not a man, woman, or a child to say that he was kind to them, and for the memory of that kindness would be kind to him. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. Spirit, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. I understand you, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, spirit. I have not the power to lift that sheet. Is death always like this? Is it never followed by sorrow and weeping? Let me see some tenderness connected with the death, or this dark chamber will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet, and as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. You must be getting near your father's time. Past it, Mummy, though he has walked home slowly these last few evenings. I've known him to walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulders very fast indeed. And so have I, often. But he was light to carry. And his father loved him so, he was no trouble. No trouble. There's your father at the door. There you are. One of us. Here. Here, father, sit here. Thank you. How was your day, dear? Oh, I saw Mr. Scrooge's nephew today. You did? Yes. He's a nice fellow. He saw I looked a trifle down. Just a trifle, you know. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him about Tim. He's such a sweet fellow. Somehow I didn't mind telling him. I'm heartily sorry for what Bob, he said, and heartily sorry for your good wife. By the by, how he ever knew that, I, I don't know. He knew what, my dear? That you were a good wife. Bob. It really seemed that he knew of Tim and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul, Bob. He is, and I'm sure that when we remember how gentle and patient Tim was, we shan't fall among ourselves and 
In doing so, forget of Tim. Your no father. I'm very happy. I, I am. <laughs> Tim, everyone who knew him must feel sorrow. Sorrow they'd never feel for me. Spirit, tell me the name of the man he saw lying dead. Tell me! Then I was the man who lay upon the bed. No! Answer me, the spirit! Are these things you've shown me, are they the shadows of the things that will be, or of the things that may be? Why show me this if I am past all hope? Men's lives lead to certain ends, but if those lives be changed, will not the ends be changed? Tell me that this is not my end. Tell me! I shall change my way of living. I will try to keep Christmas all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirit of all three shall be in my heart. I shall never forget the lessons that they teach. Tell me that this will change my future. Tell me that it is true! Please! Holding up his hands in the last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Scrooge fell to the bed it had become, and, failing to remain conscious, sank into a deep, deep sleep, the likes of which he had never known. No, no, what? My own bed, it's my own bed. Oh, generous spirits, thank you, kind spirits. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. I am here, the shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be, I know they will. I don't know what to do. I am as light as a feather. I am as happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. I am as giddy as a drunken man. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Scrooge was now perfectly winded, but teeming with excitement and sheer joy threw himself into the recollections of his journey. It was all true. It had all happened. For a man who had been out of practice for so many years, he gave forth a splendid laugh. A most illustrious laugh. He ran to the door, opened it, and put out his head. No fog, no mist. Clear, bright, jovial, staring cold, golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet, fresh air, merry bells, oh, glorious, glorious! Hello there! What's today? Huh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day! It's Christmas Day! I haven't missed it! The spirits have done it all in one night! They can do anything they like, of course they can! Of course they can! Hello, my fine fellow! Hello! Do you know the vultures? In the next street, but one at the corner. 
I should hope I did. An intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my luck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. What? No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. Oh, uh, yes, sir! Whoosh! <laughs> I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. The chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he arranged the cab to send the boy, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy, were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down, breathless in his chair, and again chuckled till he cried. <laughs> After a short time, he dressed himself in all his best, and at last got out into the streets. <laughs> People were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every with a delighted smile. My dear sir, how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, that is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to accept? Lord bless me! My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? My dear sir, I don't know what to say to such generosity. Don't say anything. Please, come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will. He will. We both will. Thank you. I am much obliged to you. I thank you fifty times. Bless you. Scrooge went to church, and he walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro, and patted children on the head, and questioned beggars. He never dreamed that any walk, that anything, could give him so much happiness. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Good morning, Fred. Who is this? Your uncle. Your uncle Scrooge. Uncle? I didn't know you. A smile changes me, doesn't it? But what are you doing out here? Come in, uncle. Come in. This is my uncle. My uncle Scrooge. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, Fred, you dog, who is this fellow? Not your uncle. I'll be bound. He'd never have a smile like that. He said that that Christmas was a humbug, that people who celebrated it were fools. Yes, yes, that's what he said. It was stupid of him. He won't say it again, mark you. He won't say it again, ever. And Mrs. Bess, may I tell you a secret? Here I say, now what is this? No. You tell him. Fred, darling. That's wonderful. Uncle, thank you so much. It was a wonderful party with wonderful games, wonderful family, and wonderful happiness. When it was over, Scrooge invited his nephew and Bess to join him in a visit to the Cratchit house. Of course they obliged. Christmas by good fellow than I have given you for many a year. Here, give this to your wife, your good wife. Where's Tiny Tim? He's out in the back with the others. Well, get him. Bring him here. Bring them all here. I have something for you all. Yes, sir, I shall. It's Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge. Uh, yeah. Oh, he's crazy. Quite mad off his top. Lost his buttons. Don't be stupid, Bob. Look, he gave us this. And more besides. Gave it to us. 
Yes. Then he has gone mad. Bob, what shall we do? <laughs> <laughs> Our children, Bob, save them. Thank heaven. Mr. Fred, you've come for him. Horse, poor fellow. Do you think he'd gone by me too? No, we haven't come for him. He told us to wait outside. Said he had some presents he wanted to give you. Then he's all right? I hope so. He made me his partner. We're to be married, Bob. Isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful. Yes. My wife, my dear. Has he gone? He's all right. Come along. You must meet him. Bob Cratchit. Yes, sir. Pass out the punch. Yes, sir. I'm going to raise your salary, Bob. Thank you, sir. And when Peter gets a little older, we'll have a job for him, too. <laughs> Won't we, Fred? Yes, sir. Everything for everybody. Here it is, sir. I'm a little rusty at this. I've never done it before, but may I? Yes, yes please do. To all of us, everywhere, a Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, everyone. <laughs>